Ian Agle received his PhD from the University of California in San Diego in 1998. His advisor was Mike Friedman. Subsequently, he was a postdoc at UC Davis with Bill Thurston. He's currently a professor at UC Berkeley. Ian has won a multitude of awards, a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2005, a Clay Research Award in 2009, the 2012 Senior Berwick Prize of the London Math Society, and the 2013 AMS Veblen Prize, jointly with Danny Wise, who's also a speaker at this Congress. Among Ian's many achievements are the proof of the Martin tameness conjecture, his work on volumes of hyperbolic manifolds, on residual finiteness, and of course, the proofs of the virtual fibering and virtually Hocken conjectures. In many ways, Ian's lecture marks the realization of Thurston's extraordinary vision for three-dimensional manifolds as presented in his famous 1982 bulletin of the AMS paper. In the past few years, all the major components of Thurston's program have come into place, the keystone being Ian Nagel's work. Ian's title is The Virtual Hawking Conjecture. Ian. Thanks a lot, Ron. Can you hear me OK? Well, it's an honor to uh, be the first plenary speaker here, and um, I uh, hope to be able to talk a little bit about some of the work that uh, that Ron was alluding to. So, um, so I actually changed the the title of the, the talk slightly from the um, from the title I submitted, but the, the the proceedings paper actually has a lot more than um, than I'll get to in the talk. So you could uh, have a look at that if you like. Okay, so um, what I want to talk about then is um, some questions of Thurston that appeared in a uh, in his paper in the Bolton of the AMS in um, 1983. So at the end of the paper, uh, so he was surveying his work on three manifolds and Kleinian groups. And um, at the end of the paper, he asked 24 questions, which um, have been very influential in the field for the past 30 years or so. So um, today, I want to concentrate on three of these questions, which are closely related, as you'll see, and um, discuss the, the resolution of these, of these questions. So question 16 says, does every spherical three manifold have a finite sheeted cover, which is Hawken? And I don't expect people to understand the terms yet, so a lot of the talk will be going over explaining wh what these questions mean. Um, so this question actually originated in a paper of Waldhausen from 1968 in which he developed the theory of, of Hawken manifolds. Hawken manifolds named after the, um, the three-manifold topologist Wolfgang Hawken. Question 17, does every aspherical three-manifold have a finite sheeted cover with positive first Bay number. And then question 18, does every hyperbolic three manifold have a finite sheet of cover which fibers over the circle? And Thurston says, this dubious sounding question seems to have a definite chance of a positive answer. So, um, so these are the questions I'd like to, to talk about today. <clears throat> um, so first of all, I want just a little bit of terminology. Um, if a property holds for a finite sheeted covering space of a manifold M, then, um, then we say that M virtually has the property. So in this talk, I'm expecting um, people understand uh, sort of basics of algebraic topology of covering spaces and, and things like that. So if there's a, a finite sheeted cover that, that, um, that has that property, then we say that M virtually has it. So virtually meaning up to finite index has become a standard uh, kind of terminology in the field. And, um, has other uses in other areas of mathematics. So the goal of the talk then will be to explain these questions and then how they reduce to a conjecture uh, that Donnie Wise made in um, 2010 or 11 or so uh, in geometric group theory. Um, so then I'll describe some aspects of the, of the proof of this conjecture and thus the resolution of, of Thurston's questions. So um, 
Also in this talk, I'm just gonna focus on the case of hyperbolic free manifolds. So with the geometrization theorem of Perelman, um, the, the most interesting case of questions 16 and 17, which were stated for aspherical free manifolds, is actually uh, for the case of hyperbolic free manifolds. So the, the geometric decomposition implies these questions for all of the other uh, possible geometries or um, manifolds with a non-trivial geometric decomposition. So um, if you don't know what, what those, um, what the geometrization conjecture says, that's, um, I'll just focus on the hyperbolic case today. So um, <clears throat> one remarkable feature is that these, uh, these questions are essentially purely topological about closed aspherical free manifolds, which has a, a topological definition, but the, the proof of them uses almost entirely geometric techniques. So um, that's, that's one interesting feature of three manifold topology is that the geometric perspective has been so extremely powerful and, and successful. <clears throat> okay, so what is hyperbolic space? So um, one possible way of describing it is the upper half space model for hyperbolic space. I hope a, a lot of people have seen that here, but um, if not, one way you can think about it is if you have a chunk of glass sitting on a, on a table where the speed of light is variable, so it, it's proportional to the height above the table, then um, if you were to shoot a ray of light like a laser beam through this glass, it would take a path that would form a semicircular arc that was orthogonal to the table. And as you go towards the tabletop, the speed of light would, would slow down and you could actually never reach it. So um, these, these semicircles or vertical lines, if you shot it directly straight up, form the geodesics in a hyperbolic metric. So the distance between two points is the time that light takes to get between them. And in principle, you could make a physical model of hyperbolic space if you could make a, um, a chunk of glass like this using vapor diffusion or something. Um, but as far as I know, no one's ever done that. In any case, um, the nice thing about this hyperbolic metric is that it's completely homogeneous. So um, any, any point, and isotropic, so any point can be taken to any other point um, by a, a isometry, meaning that it preserves the lengths of geodesics, namely it preserves the semicircles. That's clear, if you have two points at the same height, you can just translate the glass along and the glass will look the same. It turns out if you also take, do similarities, then that preserves um, the, the metric abstractly because semicircles go to semicircles. And um, then there's other transformations, namely inversions through spheres orthogonal to the tabletop that realize the isometries of hyperbolic space. And um, the orientation preserving isometries are given by the group PSL2C, which acts on the tabletop, which is if you extend it to infinity and add a point infinity is the complex projective plane and it acts naturally on there. So that's uh, one possible way of describing hyperbolic free space. So manifolds then modeled on this geometry are uh, called hyperbolic free manifolds. So um, these are, if you're familiar with Riemannian geometry, these are Riemannian metrics of constant curvature minus one with uh, the fundamental group of such a manifold then is called a Kleinian group. This is a classical terminology um, if it's at least finitely generated. So that's a standard hypothesis in the theory of hyperbolic manifolds. In fact, the infinitely generated case is sort of wide open. There's no conjectural classification or picture. So uh, some classic examples of hyperbolic three manifolds then are um, the cipher weber dodecahedral space, which you obtain by taking a, a dodecahedron uh, as shown here and you glue the opposite sides in the, in the way um, indicated. So uh, every pair of opposite faces get glued with a twist. Uh, so if you took a chunk of this hyperbolic glass and you cut out a nice polyhedron where the uh, dihedral angles were all two pi over three, the faces are, consist of hemi sections of hemispheres that are orthogonal to the boundary, then um, you would get, uh, and you gl somehow abstractly glued the faces together, sort of like uh, Pac-Man tunneling through um, the uh, video game screen, then um, in principle you could make a manifold that is the, topologically the cipher Weber dodecahedral space. And it has, 
intrinsically a, uh, a hyperbolic metric. It's only um, now local, um, locally homogeneous. Every point has a little neighborhood that's isometric to any other point, but not necessarily globally homogeneous. So uh, another example uh, originally discovered by Robert Riley is the figure eight knot complement. Now this is a manifold which in the hyperbolic metric has finite volume, um, but it's non-compact. So the Cypher-Weber space is compact. The figure eight knot complement though is, um, has a cusp. Uh, there's, if you, it, so the, the complement of the figure eight is you take the three sphere, and you take the figure eight knot sitting inside of it and remove a tubular neighborhood of that. And then the complement emits, emits a complete uh, hyperbolic metric. And the, uh, the boundary of the tubular neighborhood is a torus that's pi one injective into uh, the, the knot complement. And um, it extends so that, that, that torus can be sort of pushed off to infinity in the figure eight knot complement. Um, and so that even though it's non-compact, it has this nice product structure um, towards infinity in, in the manifold. And there's a similar sort of picture for the whitehead link complement, which is the third thing pictured here. And um, that ha now is non-compact as well, but it has sort of two ends that correspond to the two link components that have been drilled out of, of free space. So it turns out that these have complete hyperbolic metrics of um, constant curvature minus one. You can realize them as, as groups, uh, discrete subgroups of PSL2C acting on upper half space of hyperbolic free space as described on the previous slide. Okay, so these are the sort of examples that, um, that three manifold topologists have been analyzing for, uh, for a century or so. Okay, so now I need to define the terms in Thurston's questions. So a compact three manifold with, um, and I'll assume hyperbolic interior here. Um, by hyperbolic interior, I mean um, if you took the, an open neighborhood of the, so the figure eight knot, and then the complement would be a compact manifold. Um, the interior, so if you remove that, um, the boundary torus, then you get a non-compact manifold which has a complete hyperbolic metric. So that's what I mean by interior. Then it's Hawken if it contains an embedded pi one injective surface. So examples then are, um, are not complements. There's also an irreducible, irreducibility condition you need in the general case, but the hyperbolicity deals with that. Uh, so examples of non hawken manifolds, the Cypher-Weber space is a, is a non hawken manifold. This was discovered a few years ago by Burton, Rubinstein, and Tillman. Now I should also say that this talk is, is not uh, very historically accurate. So I'm, um, I'm only getting to the um, key ideas that are needed to discuss the, the theorems. Um, so if you want more sort of um, references to the uh, previous results in this subject, um, you can have a look at the proceedings paper. There's just not enough time to cover all the work that have been done. So I should just say that there was many known examples of non hawken manifolds uh, that didn't, um, that don't contain a pi injective surface uh, due originally to Waldhausen and Thurston and various other people. So a three manifold then is virtually Hawken. Virtually means there's a fine sheet of cover with that property. If there's a fine sheet of cover, that contains an embedded pi one injective surface. So again, the Cypher-Weber space was known, um, it's been known for over 20 years by uh, Darren Long to be a virtually Hawken manifold. That it, there's actually an, an immersed totally geodesic surface that Long showed and lifts to an embedding in a finite sheeted covering space using some algebraic techniques. So Waldhausen conjectured that every hyperbolic three manifold it uh, has a, a finite sheet of cover which is Hawkins, it's virtually Hawkins. So that's actually not the way that he stated the question. He actually didn't conjecture it, but it's become known as Waldhausen's conjecture. He only asked as a question uh, in, in, in his papers. Um, and so this is question 16 from Thurston's list. Now a stronger question, number 17, is whether any three manifold, uh, hyperbolic three manifold has a finite sheet of cover which has positive first Betty numbers. So that what that means is that there's a homomorphism from the fundamental group of the manifold onto Z. So that's a condition that's classically known to imply that the manifold contains an embedded pi one injective surface by the loop theorem. So, um, and examples of manifolds like that are not complements. Um, but the, the interesting case of this question 
um, is for a manifold that's closed and has first spady number zero, then the question is, was, is there a covering space that has um, first spady number positive? Now I should make a comment here that um, free manifold fundamental groups have the property that they have a balanced presentation. So they have a, a presentation of the fundamental group with the same number of relators as um, generators. And so if you just write down a uh, random three manifold, say by a, a Heegard splitting, um, so you, uh, Anyways, there's standard ways of constructing these. Most likely you're gonna get a manifold that has first vein number zero. And so this question is non-trivial and um, like the Cypher Weber space, for example, since it's non hopkin has first vein number zero. So, um, so this is a stronger question, but in some, in some sense it's easier to um, analyze because it's much easier to check that a manifold has a uh, positive first vein number than um, to check that there's an embedded pi one injective surface. The, the, Question 17, whether there's, um, the Betty number is non-zero is just a linear algebra question and can, is much more amenable to computation. So for example, um, Dunfield and Thurston verified question 17 for a huge class of manifolds, um, that, a database of manifolds that three manifold topologists work with. So there's a lot of evidence for this conjecture, but again, I'm not um, covering all of the previous work on this. Okay, so uh, what about fiber three manifolds? So three manifold fibers are the circle if there's a map to a circle which the preimaginary point is a surface S which is called the fiber. So um, another way of describing it is you take a, a two dimensional surface of genus G and you cross it with an interval. So you cross it with an interval and then you glue the top to the bottom by some homeomorphism of the surface. And that creates a closed manifold. It has positive first Bayer number, um, and in fact, the surface here is pi one injective. So um, you can write down the fundamental group easily as uh, using Van Kampen's theorem, and uh, it turns out then that the, the fundamental group of the surface injects, and it's an embedded surface, so it's a Hawken. So if you're, so this is a, um, a classic example then of a, of a Hawken manifold, and um, Thurston's question 17 then is, uh, so are, are hyperbolic three manifolds virtually fibered? So is there a finite sheet of covering space of the manifold which fibers over the circle? So in some sense what that's saying is that you can construct every hyperbolic three manifold by taking this kind of construction. And I should say also that there's lots of homeomorphisms of a surface to itself uh, given by the mapping class group where you get interesting hyperbolic three manifolds. So what this question is asking is, can you obtain any hyperbolic free manifold by gluing a surface to top to bottom and then taking some finite group of symmetries of that manifold to get a quotient manifold? So you quotient out by a finite group action. Can every hyperbolic free manifold be obtained that way? That's, uh, that's the essence of Thurston's question. So it's virtually fibered if there's a finite sheet of cover the fibers. Then it has also po first, positive first band numbers, so it's stronger than question, um, question 16. And um, if M fibers, then the fiber surface is pi injective, so it's Hawken. So Thurston's question 18 implies uh, questions um, 16 and 17. Um, and again, this has become known as Thurston's virtual fibering conjecture. Okay, so I think now I've described, uh, at least given the definitions for um, questions fit, uh, 16 through seven, uh, 17 and 18 and for, um, from Thurston's list. Um, and uh, now what I want to do is transition to geometric group theory to describe uh, the techniques that are used to, um, to analyze these questions. Okay, so um, I need to talk now about some other sorts of uh, geometric constructions which lie outside the field of three manifold topology. So a, a topological space is uh, called locally cad zero cubed complex if it's a cube complex. So a cube complex is like a simplicial complex. You take a bunch of cubes, and here by cube I mean uh, n-dimensional cube, so um, not necessarily just a three-dimensional cube. And you glue um, these cubes together by um, gluing faces together. And um, you can put a metric on that which um, is locally the, the standard Euclidean metric. Um, so I'm not going to give the precise definition of a, of a cat zero metric, 
what it means is that it's sort of um, more um, non-positively curved than the Euclidean metric. Um, so this CAD zero condition is, is a form of non-positive curvature. So what Gromov showed, though, is that uh, this metric condition is equivalent to a purely combinatorial condition, namely that the links of the vertices in the cube complex are, are flags and plusial complexes. I'll, I'll describe that on the next page. But I need another um, bit of, um, of discussion about these cube complexes, what they're important for in, in this context. In a locally cad cube complex, there's canonical immersed co-dimension one uh, subcomplexes. So in each cube, you have, if it's an n cube, n-dimensional cube, you have um, n hyperplanes, which are n minus one dimensional cubes that slice through it by letting one of the coordinates be equal to a constant. And there's a unique way to extend these, uh, these midplanes from one cube to the next. They might change dimension, but they're always co-dimension one. They're always one lower dimension than the cube that they sit inside of. So uh, these give you certain um, sub-complexes, but they're actually uh, might self-intersect. So the, the, the cube complex might come around and intersect itself. And I want to think of the different sheets um, inside of a cube, which um, might be in the same connected component as being distinct. So it's actually like um, an immersion. It's like a map of the uh, cube complex in, into this higher dimensional one, which is locally an embedding, which is what, what I mean by an immersion. Um, okay, so that's, that's the role that um, these cube complexes play is they, they organize these certain kinds of hyperplanes. What's uh, the Gromov's link condition? So in a simplicial, compl a simplicial complex is, is flag if um, whenever you see the one skeleton of a n simplex, so you see a, an n plus one um, complete graph, then there's actually a, an n simplex that sits there. So um, if I had three squares glued together around a vertex, then the link of the vertex is you just sort of chop off the corner. When you chop off the corner of a cube, you get a, if it's an n cube, you get an n minus one simplex. And these form a simplicial complex, which is the link of that vertex. And if I see a triangle there, then the flag condition says they're actually, so I've, uh, sorry, if I see uh, three edges glued around, then I actually should see a triangle glued in there, a two simplex. And that means that if I had these three squares glued together, there's actually a cube that fills it in. So the three squares glued together give a sort of local positive curvature so that you have to glue the cube in to make, um, to restore the non-negative curvature that's required of a cat zero metric. Um, and here I've, I borrowed this slide from someone that used a different terminology. Um, Rob Grice is using NPC for non-positive curvature, but that's the same as locally cat zero. Okay, so flag complex. So, so you, can, you can check very easily that a cube complex is locally cat zero, you just look at the links of the vertices and you check to see whether they're flag complexes. Oh, and I should say also that the, um, the examples drawn in this picture, this picture of Donnie Wise, are all um, locally cat zero complexes. In the, the one dimensional case is just a tree, in that case the midpoints are vertices, so the um, midplanes are sort of more complicated in higher dimensions. All right, so, um, now what we, what we do is we take a topological space and we say it's cubulated if it's homotopy equivalent to a locally cat zero cube complex. So um, that will be called a cubulation of a topological space. And this is, we're, we want this for three manifolds. So uh, we say a three manifold uh, is cubulated if it's homotopy equivalent to a locally cat zero cube complex. Now just a remark, um, here it's only homotopy equivalent. So these, the cube complex might be much higher dimensional, it might not be homeomorphic to the three manifold. In fact, um, Tao Li showed uh, many years ago that there are hyperbolic three manifolds which are not homeomorphic to any cat zero cube complex. So, um, so you can't always have a, a hyperbolic three manifold that's homotopy equivalent to, uh, or sorry, homeomorphic to a cat, cat zero cube complex. And Tao Li will be speaking um, on, on Friday uh, in, in room 300 here at 5 p.m. Although he's speaking about uh, a different topic. So, um, 
Okay, so uh, back to cubulations then. So ther theorems of Segev associate a co-compact action of pi 1m on a, on a simply connected Cadzio cube complex if m contains a pi 1 injective surface. So uh, I guess I need to describe a little bit about what I mean here. So um, a three manifold, uh, if, there's, if there's a map of a surface into the three manifold that's injective on fundamental group, then we say there's a pi 1 injective surface. If that happens, then Segev in his thesis uh, at Berkeley in uh, 1996 or so showed that um, you get an action of the fundamental group of that three manifold on, a, on a, a, an actually globally simply connected um, cat zero cube complex. And in fact, uh, the construction associates to each immersed pi one injective surface um, a, an action uh, on a hyperplane that's um, preserved by the by the surface group. So uh, as an example, if you apply Segev's construction in the right way to a uh, free manifold that uh, fibers over the circle, then his, his um, machinery just pops out an action of the fundamental group on the line by translations, factoring through the map to Z that you get from the vibration of the circle. Uh, in the case of a surface that's immersed and is only embedded in a fine sheet of covering, so it's, that's called a virtual fiber, if it's an immersed surface that lifts to a, a covering space where it's the fiber of a vibration, then um, Segev's construction in that case gives rise to a crystal graphic group action. So you actually get an action on a product of ours and the, the sort of covering translations that correspond to the, the covering space permute the different R factors, so you get a, a crystallographic group action. So that's to give you a flavor of um, Segev's construction, which I don't have time to go into. Another uh, example of one lower dimension of Segev's construction, if you took a two dimension, so his, his theorem actually applies much more generally than I've indicated. It applies in particular to surfaces. So if you take a bunch of geodesics on a surface, so here's examples of geodesic lines in, in the hyperbolic plane, then you can construct an action on a cube complex in which each hyperplane corresponds to one of your one-dimensional um, geodesics on this surface. And each time these guys cross um, simultaneously, so if you have three geodesics crossing, then you'll get a, a three-dimensional cube there. So if you, look, if you look at the pattern of hyperplanes on the right there, they'll correspond exactly to the pattern of lines here. So that the same sort of thing holds one dimension higher. If you have immersed surfaces in the manifold, you look at the universal cover, you look at how the surfaces cross each other. Every time you have n surfaces crossing, you'll get an n-dimensional cube associated to Segev's cube complex. And then uh, you have to glue those together carefully in some way to get a, a global action on the, on the cube complex. So that's to give you a flavor of, of Segev's construction. Another example of a cubulated hyperbolic free manifold is um, this picture from the cover of Thurston's uh, book on three manifold topology. So um, this is actually homeomorphic to a cat zero cube complex. So here's a, a picture of hyperbolic space as it would look if you were sitting inside of it. And um, you can see here a certain pattern tessellation by right angle dodecahedra. Now if you take the sort of dual uh, cell structure so associated to each vertex here, you can put a, a vertex in each dodecahedron, connect them up by edges, and you get a cube associated to each vertex in this picture. So it's sort of a, um, a, a dual tessellation. Then you get tessellation by cubes, which is locally cat zero cubed. And you can find a three manifold who's, um, that preserves this, whose fundamental group preserves this uh, tessellation. And in fact, you can see here certain totally geodesic planes that um, you see the kind of circle of uh, pentagons that form a hyperbolic plane, that's a totally geodesic plane that's gonna be um, embedded or immersed inside of this three manifold, depending on which, um, which group uh, acting on this sort of hyperbolic three-dimensional crystal, crystal you, you choose. So um, that's an example then of a, of a space that's um, a cat zero cube complex, and it's actually homeomorphic to a three manifold. So these uh, examples of these things have been known for, uh, for many, many years. And actually, uh, in the ICM exhi exhibit hall, uh, someone had some three-dimensional videos where you can fly through a space like this. So if you, if you go over there, um, there's some nice, uh, nice renderings of, the, of these kind of pictures. Okay, so it's a theorem then 
of um, Kahn and Markovich in 2009 that if you have a closed hyperbolic free manifold, it contains a um, pi-1 injective surface, so a map of a surface in the free manifold that's pi-1 injective, and actually can be made sort of arbitrarily close to being totally geodesic. So you, you can actually realize it by a map of a surface where the principal curvatures are very close to zero. So it's very, it's tracking a, a geodesic plane as close as you like. Um, as you get it closer and closer to being geodesic, though, these surfaces can get more and more complicated, much higher genus. And these surfaces are usually not, not anywhere close to being embedded. <clears throat> so they have lots of, um, of double points or triple points if you map them into the three manifold. So Kahn and Markovich will be speaking about this work on, um, uh, on August 18th in Hall E14. So you can go hear more about this um, at their talk. So uh, immediately after their result, then, it was realized by Bergeron and Wise that this implies that closed hyperbolic three manifolds are, are cubulated. So they're actually homotopy equivalent to a locally cat zero cube complex. And again, the, um, the hyperplanes in this cube complex will correspond to these immersed Kahn Markovich surfaces in the three manifold. But their construction will lead to the, the, the planes, the, the immersed surfaces will lift to planes in universal cover where they, they cross each other many times. And so we'll give to a m very high dimensional cube complex. In principle, I think you could estimate the dimension depending on the geometry of the three manifold, but that hasn't been done explicitly. So um, they show this by using a certain condition. So they show that if you take any geodesic and hyperbolic three space, so one of these semicircles, that you can find a, a lift of a the universal cover of one of these Kahn Markovich surfaces to H3, in which um, the boundary, the, the two points at the ends of the geodesic are separated by the, bound, the boundary at infinity of the, um, of the immersed surface. So here's an example of a, a so called quasi Fuchsian surface group. It's a group that preserves. A circle, it it's, um, has Hausdorff's dimension greater than one, which is why it looks like a fractal, but it's, topologically it's a circle that separates the two endpoints of this geodesic. So a Kahn Markovich surface in the years of cover could look something like this. And if you can, if for any two points in boundary of hyperbolic space, you can find one of these circles that separates them coming from a Kahn Markovich surface, then their criterion says that the three manifold will be cubulated. So you, you apply Segui's machinery, it gives you an action on a cube complex. And this separating condition implies that that action is proper. So you take the quotient space and you get uh, something homotopy equivalent to the three manifold. It has the same fundamental group. Since everything's aspherical, it's determined on the level of fundamental group. OK, so now um, I need to introduce some more geometric group theory to um, see how this is, is useful for analyzing uh, three manifolds. Sorry, let me just check on the time here. OK, so uh, I'll discuss right-angled Artin groups. Um, just a few slides on that. So um, a right-angled Artin group is a, is a group with a very simple presentation. So if you're given a simplicial graph gamma, then you get a generator for every vertex of that graph. And um, any edge of the graph, you get a relator in the group, which says that the generators corresponding to the vertices of that edge commute with each other. So um, it has a very simple presentation. So if we have nodes V and W that are connected by an edge, then um, there's a relator that says uh, VW equals WV. So if we take the graph with no edges, then we get no relators, and it's just a free group on the number of generators, the number of vertices. If we take the complete graph, then um, a complete graph, every pair of generators commutes, and you just get the free abelian group of the rank the number of vertices. So these writing Alartan groups sort of interpolate between free groups and free abelian groups. And um, even though they're a very simple class of groups to define, they've been a, a great source of examples and counterexamples in geometric group theory. The, the subgroups of these groups tend to be extremely interesting, even though the groups are, are very simple to define. Um, and in fact, you do get some free manifold groups uh, with boundary appearing in here. For example, the, well, the three torus has fundamental group Z cubed, for example, or if you take a, um, a tree, then um, it turns out you get a, the fundamental groups of certain link complements. So these, these, these groups also have very nice 
locally cad zero cube complexes. Um, so particularly these groups are the fundamental groups of a locally cad zero cube complex, which is called the Salvetti complex. So the way you get the Salvetti complex is you take a wedge of loops, one for each vertex of your graph gamma. So you take a bunch of loops, you glue them together at a point, and then every time you see a, a, an edge, you put in a, um, a square that gives you a commutator. So that gives you a, a two torus that expresses that two, those two generators commute with each other. And um, any time you see a k click in your graph, you put in a, a k-dimensional cube, which gives you a k-dimensional torus that um, all the all the faces, the two-dimensional faces, then commute with each other because the, every pair of uh, vertices is connected by an edge. So this is called the, the Salvetti complex. And um, you can check that the links of the vertices are flags and pushal complexes. So it satisfies Gromov's locally CAD zero condition. It's, uh, you can sort of functorially construct the one skeleton of the, um, of the links of the vertices from the, the graph gamma by some doubling procedure. And then you can see that the, um, that the simpl simplicities there are all filled in by these, the corners of these cubes. <clears throat> okay, so uh, some examples then of Salvetti complexes. For the free group, you just get a wedge of loops. Um, for the abelian group, you get an n-dimensional torus because um, you stick in an n-dimensional cube there because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an n-click. And um, the universal cover then is just homeomorphic to Rn. In the case of uh, the wedge of loops, you, the universal cover is a tree. So these are globally cat zero cube complexes in the universal cover. If you take a, a sequence of uh, three edges glued end to end, then you see um, for each edge, you see a two torus that's saying that those two generators commute, and they get glued together along circles. Turns out if you thicken this up, you get the, the complement of a, of a certain link. So now um, I need to describe, and again, you'll hear more about this if you go to Donnie Wise's talk, um, describe a little bit about certain special class of cube complexes, which are analogous to, in some sense, to Hawk and three manifolds. So recall this sort of um, dictionary between cube complexes and three manifolds, that if you have uh, an immersed surface in three manifold, Sagiv's theorem gives you uh, a hyperplane, an action on a cube complex, and a hyperplane of that cube complex that corresponds to the fundamental group of the surface. If you apply Sagiv's construction to an embedded surface, then in fact the hyperplane in his construction will, will also be embedded. So um, a special cube complex is analogous to a Hawkin three manifold, which has an embedded pi one injective surface, in that it has an embedded, it has all of its hyperplanes are embedded. But it satisfies a couple of extra conditions introduced by um, Hagelin and, and Wise. So um, the hyperplanes can be considered as equivalence classes of oriented edges. And if you have an edge, uh, so two edges on the opposite side of a square, then we say that they're um, equivalent to each other. So they're, um, there's a hyperplane that sort of uh, is dual to them. And you look at the equivalence relation generated by that on edges. So if there's two edges that are equivalent to each other and pointing in towards a vertex, then, we, then that's called an osculation. And um, that's a bad configuration. So a special cube complex has no osculating edges, no osculating hyperplanes. Uh, another case is you might have two hyperplanes which cross somewhere in a square and you see t uh, opposite edges which are equivalent. And if those edges are um, osculating somewhere else, so they meet at a vertex without having a square that fills it in, then those two hyperplanes are said to interosculate. So they cross somewhere and then they're tangent somewhere else. Then uh, that's also forbidden in a special cube complex. So these conditions are kind of technical, but um, the, it turns out they're precisely the right conditions for saying that um, these, uh, the fundamental groups of these special cube complexes embed into right angle art groups. So the motivating example of a special cube complex then are the Salvetti complexes for these right angle art groups. Salvetti complexes, you have a hyperplane co corresponding to each edge of the defining graph of the right angle art group. And um, that hyperplane is embedded and you can also check these um, hyperplanes are, well, they're embedded and they're, um, they're not self osculating or inter -osculating. They also have to be two sided, meaning that the edges, orientations of the edges in this equivalence relation don't get reversed. So um, here's a, an example of a special cube complex. I've drawn the walls first, so here's a genus two surface, and I take a sequence of six curves which um, form a, a chain. Then um, you can 
apply Segee's construction to this example, and you get this cube complex, which is actually made of squares. So these little, these green edges form the one skeleton, and you have a, topologically anyways, a square um, that, that goes around each uh, vertex of intersection between these circles. And you can check that this is a locally cat zero cube complex. The hyperplanes are embedded because we, um, each hyperplane was embedded over here. It's just an embedded circle. Each component of the hyperplanes are embedded. And um, you can also check the, uh, the hyperplanes are not osculating or um, self-osculating or inter-osculating. Um, it's just a combinatorial condition, again, that can be checked for any given cube complex. Um, now, associated to a, uh, a special cube complex, you have the, what's called the crossing graph, gamma of x. So um, here you put a vertex for each hyperplane, and if two hyperplanes cross somewhere, then you put an edge between them. So you get a construction of a graph this way, and so the, the beautiful theorem then of Hagelin and Wise is that, oh, sorry, and I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, it, well, I'll just say it right now and get to it in a few slides. So um, the, there's a right angle Larkin group associated with this crossing graph, and uh, there's a natural map from the special cube complex to the Salvetti complex of this right angle Larkin group, where you take a square, if you look at a square, you have some hyper, or hyperplanes going through it, or an N cube in general, and you map that to the corresponding n cube of the right angle Larkin group, uh, Salvetti complex of the right angle Larkin group of the crossing graph. And what um, Hagelin and Wise show is that these special cube complexes, that map is a, it's local isometry. In particular, it's a pi one injection from the fundamental group of the special cube complex to the right angle Larkin group. So that's um, the significance of these special cube complexes. They allow you to inject the, fun certify that the fundamental group embeds into a right angle Larkin group and then inherits all the nice properties that right angle Larkin groups have. Okay, but now I need to uh, uh, talk about a couple more definitions. So a, a, a Gromov hyperbolic group is defined um, from the Cayley graph for a group. Um, so if you have a, a presentation for a group, um, there's some number of generators, uh, those, those form a, a, a graph and um, you can, you get the Cayley graph of the group by um, having a vertex for each element of the group and an edge between two vertices if one of the generators, when you multiply it by the generator, it sends one vertex to the other vertex. So that's uh, the Cayley graph, if, um, which is a, a coarse sort of geometric uh, stand-in for the group. So uh, Gromov introduced it, the, the notion of a, of a hyperbolic group um, if the Cayley graph satisfies what's called Rips thin triangle condition. So if you have a, a Cayley graph, you get a metric space just by declaring that each edge has length one. You take the minimum distance along paths between two points. And if you take a triangle with vertices A, B, and C, then the, um, if we take a geodesic path between B and C, that has to lie within a delta neighborhood of the union of the two edges connecting, uh, geodesics connecting A and B and A and C. Um, then a, a subgroup of a hyperbolic group is called lambda quasi-convex if for every element in the group, the geodesic connecting the identity of that element lies in a, um, a lambda neighborhood, every point is distance lambda away from some point in that subgroup H, which just corresponds to vertices in the, in the graph. So uh, here's a sort of schematic picture of a, a Rips thin triangle condition. If we look at Euc a Euclidean triangle, uh, Euclidean space, then that metric is not Gromov hyperbolic. So uh, Gromov hyperbolicity can be defined more generally for metric spaces in terms of this triangle condition. So if you take a, an equilateral triangle in the plane and um, you take any delta, you can scale it large enough so that the union of two edges did not lie in the delta, uh, sorry, one edge did not lie in the delta neighborhood of the union of the other two edges. Whereas if you take a, uh, a simplicial tree, that gives you a metric space. And if I take the edges of geodesics connecting A and B, A and C, and B and C, then actually BC lies in the zero neighborhood of the union of the two edges, the two geodesics connecting A and B and A and C. So that's actually zero hyperbolic. Um, and in the hyperbolic plane, um, the hyperbolicity constant's log of one plus root two. And um, the, uh, in that case, it turns out that you know, any edge of a triangle will lie in some delta neighborhood of uh, the other two edges. Um, 
So uh, examples then of hyperbolic groups are Kleinian groups with, which don't contain any z squared subgroups. So for example, the fundamental group of a closed hyperbolic free manifold. <clears throat> and examples of quasi-convex subgroups are given by these um, cyclic subgroups. So just if you take the fundamental group of a, of a closed geodesic that maps into the manifold, then that gives you a, a cyclic subgroup that's quasi-convex, it turns out. And any uh, surface which is close to being totally geodesic, like the Kahn Markovich surfaces, will, be, will give you quasi convex subgroups of that three manifold group, which is the Gromov hyperbolic group. So, okay, so now I'm um, going to um, say the theorem of Hagenham wise from 2007. So, if X is a, is a compact special cube complex, so it has all these embedded hyperplanes, then the fundamental group embeds in a right angled Artin group. And so um, Donnie Wise is speaking um, on August 20th um, at 3 p.m. in Hall E56. So um, the proof I already indicated. So you take your, some, your um, special cube complex, you take all the hyperplanes there, you get a, a crossing graph associated with the hyperplanes, and you get a map uh, between, um, from this, this special cube complex to the Salvetti complex, of that uh, writing the Lartan group associated with the crossing graph. And the special conditions that no self osculating or inter osculating conditions of Hagelin Wise are precisely the, one, the conditions that you need. It turns out that they're necessary conditions, but they're also sufficient for that map to be a pi 1 injectum, a, a locally isometric map. And so, therefore, the fundamental group of this cube complex will be a subgroup of the writing the Lartan group associated to that graph. Well, um, actually, a, a good example of this uh, theorem is if you start with the Salvetti complex of a right angle Lartan group, then this um, construction of the crossing graph and then the right angle Lartan group will actually just give you back the identity map from the Salvetti complex to itself. That's a fairly good, easy exercise that's a special case of their theorem. So, um, why are Back to three manifolds, why are we interested in all these geometric constructions? So in 2008, I proved that um, if you have a, a three manifold that's virtually special cubulated, so remember what virtual means. It means that, um, so cubulated means that it's homotopy equivalent to a locally cat zero cube complex. Virtual means that there's a fine sheet of cover of that complex, which is a special cube complex, it's virtually special cubulated. That uh, means that there's, there's a covering space of the three manifold, which is cubulated homotopy equivalent to a special cube complex, then uh, the three manifold is virtually fibered. It has a fine sheet of cover that fibers over the circle. Notice here a couple of things. So um, if you have a special cubulation, then um, so you have this locally cat zero cube complex X, then or, um, if X, sorry, the fine sheet of cover of it, which is special X tilde, then that that group will embed into a right angle Lartan group. Now, right angle Lartan groups have the property that they have positive first Betty number. If you uh, take the, um, uh, the abelianization of the group, you just get a free abelian group on n generators. And so um, it turns out that any um, subgroup like this um, will, uh, will end up having a positive first Betty number. And um, that condition, actually a stronger version of that uh, observation um, there's a strong form of residual solvability, which I don't have time to go into, that I call the reefers property that was introduced in this paper, RFRS, residually finite rational solvable, which implies that um, it told for writing alarm groups and passes to subgroups and implies that the three manifold is virtually fibered. So the, the proof of that um, result uses the technique of, uh, introduced by Dave Gabay of uh, suture manifold theory. Okay, so. Um, now I can, can get back to the, um, the, the main conjecture. So uh, Wise formulated in 2011 a conjecture in geometric group theory which implies the virtual Hawking conjecture and the virtual fibering conjecture. So, um, and then I, I was able to use his techniques to prove that in um, 2012. So if you have a cubulation, so a, a compact locally cat zero cube complex with hyperbolic fundamental group then it has a finite sheet of cover, which is a special cube complex. So you might start with a cube complex, you know, that has first Bayon number equal to zero, um, so, and you know, all the hyperplanes are immersed, they have lots of self-intersections, et cetera. 
uh, then, but with hyperbolic fundamental group, now that's a key hypothesis here. There's actually examples of Berger and Moses from 2001 of cube complexes that um, don't have hyperbolic fundamental group and which are not virtually special. In fact, their fundamental groups are, are, um, are simple, so they admit no finite sheet of covering spaces, no, no non-trivial covering spaces whatsoever. So, um, or as regular covering space, I mean. So anyways, the, uh, the cubulations with hyperbolic fundamental group, though, um, are behaving so the opposite, and they have lots of finite sheet of covers, and they have a cover that is, has embedded hyperplanes. And then the corollary is, uh, if you have a closed hyperbolic free manifold, then it virtually fibers, and it actually inherits lots of other properties that I'm uh, not gonna go into now, but you can read about, again, in the uh, proceedings paper. So, and this resolves um, then Thurston's question 16 through 18, because you have a hyperbolic free manifold, it has a finite sheet of cover that fibers are the circle, uh, since it's virtually special, and uh, that implies that it's Hawken and positive first Bayer number. Um, and, and again, the, um, the general case follows from the geometrization theorem. <clears throat> now the proof of, um, of this result makes key use of some of the techniques introduced by Wise. In particular, the malnormal special quotient theorem, uh, which is a sort of technical heart of, um, of this paper. Uh, and that theorem uh, was obtained in, in partial collaboration with, with Hagland, um, Frederick Hagland and Tim Shu. And again, uh, I, I encourage you to, to go to Donnie Wise's talk to learn more about these, these things. Now, I just wanted to mention that um, a key uh, ingredient in the proof of this um, conjecture of, of Wise is, uh, is joint with uh, Daniel Groves and Jason Manning, and it's, it appears as appendix to our paper, to, to my paper. It's based on a, a previous paper that we, um, that was about five years um, older, which um, proved sort of a weaker version of this result, but um, with Wise's uh, work, in particular the Malinois Special Quotient Theorem became uh, this, uh, this important um, sort of ingredient in the, in the proof. Um, so let G be hyperbolic group, H a subgroup which is quasi-convex and which is a virtually special subgroup. So what I mean by that is that H is the fundamental group of a capsule cube complex which has a finite sheet of cover that is, uh, that is special. Then for any element G which is not in H, it's in the group G but not in H, then there's a homomorphism from the group G, phi taking G to some group K. In, in fact, that K can be chosen to be a hyperbolic group, turns out. Then um, in which phi of G is not contained in phi of H, and phi of H is a finite group. So I just, um, I, I can't really get into um, uh, too much about the, the proof of this, um, but it makes use, as I said before, of Mal Wise's malnormal special quotient theorem, a technique called uh, word hyperbolic Dane filling, which is developed by Groves and Manning and um, Osen, and a notion of uh, height of quasi-convex subgroups, which is measuring sort of how uh, how much they, um, how immersed they are, how, how much self-intersections they have, which is introduced by Jiddick, Mitra, Rips, and Sagiv. Um, and again, I should indicate that, um, you know, the, there's lots of other people that contributed to this whole theory that I don't have uh, time to go into their work, but um, uh, the, I'll just give a brief indication of how this is used uh, in the proof. So this separability condition, it turns out, allows you to start with this cat zero cube complex with, um, say like a three manifold, um, accumulation coming from Kana Markovich's theorem and Bergeron and Wise, then um, you can use this weak separability result to find an infinite sheeted regular covering space in which all the surfaces, well, they have a finite sheeted cover that lifts to an embedding. So um, the, it's a sort of weaker form of virtual Hawken that um, is, is the first step in the, in the proof of Wise's conjecture. So you first pass through this infinite sheet of covering space, and then the idea is you sort of chop up this covering space into pieces and reassemble them to form a finite sheet of covering space. Now there's a, there's a key sort of uh, technical lemma, which is sort of the, the capstone of the, of the, uh, the argument that I, um, that, is, that I wanted to, to, to discuss now. But um, that's about all I'm gonna say about the, uh, the proof. So now this um, lemma says you have a graph of bounded valence K less than or equal to K and you have a group acting co-compactly on gamma. You could just take the automorphism group of the graph if you like. 
let Cn of gamma be the space of the colorings of gamma. So you color all the vertices with n colors. Then um, this can be considered as a compact topological space. It's just a subset of the product of, um, of n elements to the number of vertices of gamma. That, sorry, that should be v of gamma, not um, just gamma. Then the lemma says there's a probability measure on um, mu on CK plus 1 of gamma, which is invariant under the group action. K plus 1 is, um, is enough colors that you can color the graph. So if you have a graph with vertices of degree less than or equal to K, you can, you can always color with it at most K plus 1 colors just by um, choosing each, to color each vertex. It all has only, at most K neighbors, so there's always one color available for your vertex. So uh, we sort of make that um, argument into an equivariant argument in some sense. Um, well, the idea here, um, actually, I think I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to um, give an indication. So here, I have a graph which is, well, it's, the vertices are, are colors, sorry, are um, circles and edges, and if they intersect, then, then there's an edge between them. So this is sort of a picture of what the hyperplanes of that special cube complex of a, of a surface look like in a certain covering space. So what you do is you randomly color the uh, vertices of your graph with, um, you know, a thousand colors or some, some much larger than the number, than the degree of the vertices. And you choose the, the, um, the largest colored vertices and you, you, cho you change their, their coloring to the smallest unused um, color by a neighbor. So I start with a thousand here, I think I have a, um, 998, so I change that to the smallest unused number, which is, which is 1. And I repeat this, so I, I work my way down through the numbers, and each time, so this, uh, the random coloring has a, uh, um, there's a probability measure that's, that's invariant under, and I can push forward these probability measures under each of these maps, and so I change um, 953 to 1. Uh, some numbers might end up being used. So here, 919 gets a 2 because there's a 1 next to it. Now, actually, this is, you'd actually go to the 1,000 neighborhood to actually compute this, but I'm sort of just doing a toy model. So you keep doing this, and um, what you end up getting in the end is, well, has a high probability of any, any given uh, chunk of it to be a, a coloring of that, of that chunk. And as you let 1,000 go to infinity, this actually gives you uh, a, a measure supported on the space of colorings of the graph that's invariant in the group action because it's canonical. And I think I'm out of time. So um, I had some questions uh, at the end, but I'm going to skip those. So um, you can look at the paper to um, get that. But I just wanted to dedicate this to Bill Thurston, who uh, passed away a couple of years ago. So thanks. Thank you for a beautiful lecture. Um, the organizing committee of the Seoul ICM would like to present Ian, and in fact, all the plenary lecturers and prize winners with a special gift of a Samsung Galaxy Tab. Um, <laughs> so I'd like to do that now. Thanks. <laughs> I hope your right. daughter enjoys it. Yeah. <laughs> I think Talia will like this. Uh, are there any questions? I guess we have time. Oh. Yeah. That's a good question, you're right. So the question was, um, so you have a free manifold that's cubulated, there's a covering space that's special cubulated. Is that covering space actually fibered? My theorem uh, from 2008 that I indicated actually shows that uh, that's virtually fibered. So any uh, free manifold whose fundamental group embeds in a riding Lartan group actually has a fine sheeted covering space of fibers. I don't know of any examples actually that aren't actually fibered themselves. So that, that's, I don't know the answer to that question. That's, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so the, if you pass, so the, the property being cubulated passes to covering spaces. So, yeah, sorry, I should have indicated that. That's a good question, yeah. 
So if you pass the covering space, it's actually um, covering spaces or finite index subgroups. The cumulation property passes either direction, so it's a sort of commensurability invariant. Yeah, that's a good question. Let's thank you and one more time. Okay, thanks.